Insight Core Experienced, Episode 3, recorded April 20th and May 6, 2015. Welcome to Sight Core Experience. Sight Core Experienced, a video podcast to showcase information related to Sight Core for the benefit of the Sight Core community. Welcome to another episode of Psychor Experienced. I'm Mark Survey. Jamie Stump, welcome back. You're probably wondering why we have sunglasses on today. Well, our topic for today is from none other than Mark Stiles. How else do you honor Mr. Stiles but having sunglasses on? So we'll hear. Uh, we'll have a nice little intro for Mr. Stiles today. Um, he's requested his own music. We'll do our normal intro, but then we're going to have a little something special special. So, should be pretty fun. So, we should probably get this thing started. And go Only forward. One bear. Well, <laughs> I can't compete with that. That was great though, wasn't it? <laughs> it was very uh, impressive. I just wish I had more. Like, you know, like a <laughs> handkerchief coming out of my sleeve, you know. So... Big uh, big news this week, Psychor 8 Update 3. Um, some bug fixes from Update 2, which is why they incremented the number. So As, as opposed to as using a, the same number as, or going backwards? As opposed to a decrement. So cool, Update 3, some new fixes. I actually um, played around with it today. So oh. um, I didn't see any Update 3 thingies that... You know, really, I ran into that. I said, oh, this is different. So, um, How was the upgrade process? Easy. That's what we like to hear. It's always easy in 8. So. Oh, we can lose these now? I think we can, right? So, today we got, obviously, Mr. Stiles talking to us about um, Test Star. And we have... Some community happening, some things going on marketplace, and some closing thoughts like we always do. So let's cut into this thing. Let's get to it. All right, welcome to community happenings for episode three. So this is where Mark and I go through some things that caught our eye regarding Sitecore and, well, basically anything else that caught our eye in the past month or so. Uh, first up is going to be our featured guest for today, Mark Stiles. Mark is jumping on the video revolution. Not only is he our featured guest today, but he's coming out with his own uh, video series called Catching Exceptions, where he highlights uh, interesting people he's met, mainly developers, I believe, um, and sort of just asks them great questions to kind of Get to know them better. Let's us all get to know them better. Episode one is out. You can see it right here. Um, and his his featured guest for episode one is Sitecore MVP Nick Wesselman. So um, we definitely say have a look at that and follow uh, Mark's series, Catching Exceptions. We will. Um, I'm really excited to know more about the the community in large. Yeah. Right there, Sitecore just. Plain old developers. Yeah, I really liked it. I mean, it's I think it's something like a little less than five minutes. Um, you know, edited down. I you think mean he's I, not doing marathons like we are. Uh, yeah, he's not doing the marathons <laughs> that we are. You know, and uh, I I really like the approach to it. So it's a really good job. So I like it. I like it. Check it out. And we have our glasses back on to honor Mark. Yes, we do. Put your glasses on to watch this too. It may be better. It may be better. It may be better. You, you may filter out some of the ugly. The five people that are listening to this right now, <laughs> put on your sunglasses. It'll be better. Yes. <laughs> All right. Next up, Jaxta the Core, who uh, do, does score. Um, you mean brain Jax? That's, yeah, that's Brain Jax. <laughs> they, they do score. Right? Yes, they do. They're brain jocks and they do score and they have a blog called Jacks to the Core. There you go. Perfect. They have a blog post recently called Items Field Versions Languages, which is really interesting. I lo- the 
the intro to this i'm just going to read that and let the controversy start because it basically says here <laughs> number one items don't have versions fields fields do and number two items don't have languages fields do mm -hmm. that is basically the premise of this entire blog post um it's great because you read that first line and and your natural reaction is blasphemy that's not true um but it's a really well written post that explains um the data architecture behind Sitecore itself, which um, as architects, we would all agree is very important for to have a, a base understanding of what Sitecore is doing in the background with the content that's being entered into it. So highly recommend this one as well. Yeah, who wrote this? You know, I can't find the author. I got my sunglasses um, on. So go down to the bottom. We'll see who wrote this thing. There's a uh, comment, but I don't see who wrote it. Hey, uh, hey, Brain Jocks, you need to put your authors on here so that we can call them out. I would love, in I would love to way, know. Not yeah, in a bad way. yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd love to know who wrote this. In fact, I'd like to see one of these guys come on with us and kind of go through some things that they're doing. So that'd be kind there of cool. You go. If you're watching, get in contact with us. If you're one of the five people that are watching this right now, with sunglasses on, with sunglasses on, you know who to contact. So what I found, um, another picture of Nick Wesselman. So Milwaukee, uh, the Milwaukee Psychor meetup, the UG, uh, did a little thing on Coveo Search for Psychor and Active Commerce. Uh, videos out on YouTube. Uh, we posted the the URL below. It's always good to see a Corona bottle as the featured image <laughs> in your video. I, so I have a question. I did that. I, I gotta admit, I did that. <laughs> Is that Michelle Marie in the background I see? I believe it is, checking her phone like every other human being that doesn't realize they're on camera. <laughs> well, so. a big Sitecore experience shout out to Michelle Marie, everyone's favorite Coveo spokesperson. We should probably have Coveo on, don't you think? I am sure she will set that up the minute she hears this video. If she's not one of the five, it'll take a little bit longer. Perhaps. Perhaps. Okay. All right. So the other thing that I saw was this uh, post from John West, May 1st. Data source items versus rendering parameters in Sitecore. Um, this is a really good read, especially if you're, you're thinking about how you want to interact your templates with your components. Um, he goes through some really good stuff on just data sourcing itself as well as how you can pass multiple parameters with your rendering parameters and kind of the pros and cons of that of each it's a very short read i thought it was one of the things that kind of jumped out at me for the week this week i came across uh, an azure media services for sitecore and i personally haven't used this um, i did notice it was done in february uh, this looks kind of cool about managing videos up in Azure, in, in the Azure Media Services. So I need to check this out a little bit more um, and see how this works. It's already been rated, you know, pretty high. So I'm, I'm actually kind of looking for a reason at this point to throw it in and see how it works. So Jamie, what do you got? What I found was the uh, Sitecore Experience Extractor. Uh, so this lets us take data out of the MongoDB or the XDB and export it as tabular data. Um, a lot of Sitecore devs maybe aren't so experienced with Mongo. I know personally I wasn't experienced with Mongo before Sitecore added it in 7.5. Mm -hmm. um, so this can be helpful for you if you can't quite grasp the... Uh, mongo querying syntax or um perhaps you want to join between say your contacts uh collection and your interactions collection and you find out that mongo is not really big on joins apparently that's a no-no in NoSQL. yep um throwing it out here will certainly help you and get it in a format you can work with I like the bullet point prepare and shape data for machine learning. This is pretty cool, especially from an enterprise level where people have their reporting mechanisms in place. 
and I think this allows another way to import that in nicely. So it's something to try out. Have you tried it? I have not tried it though. I'm currently um, fringe relating, but fringe working with Tableau, um, okay. which I see that this this can work with, and and quite honestly need to get my Sitecore XDB data into Tableau, and th this might help me do so. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Compiled, simply known as Styles, is the principal web developer for the biotech company Genzyme, a San Jose company. He loves cats, sci-fi, and art. His most recent presentation during Hedgehog's Sitecore Users Virtual Summit discussed how personalization can be managed using machine learning. You should check out his blog called Project Lifecycle, a portrait of a weird yet strikingly passionate man. You can also find his modules in the Sitecore marketplace, including the Sitecore Caching Manager, the Sitecore Extranet module, the data importer, and what he's sharing with us today, the Sitecore test star. Let's give a big old warm welcome for Mark Stiles. <laughs> hey Mark, how you doing? Oh, oh thank you guys, thank you. <laughs> oh, sit, sit down, please, sit down. Well, nobody wants to see me stand up, because that, that's, <laughs> that's a bad shot. That's a bad shot. <laughs> this is as good as it's going to get right now. So. Are you look beautiful. No, <laughs> thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks for lying, but that's okay. <laughs> so, Mark, what do you got for us today? The little uh, test star. The test star. All right. So, what is the test star? The test star is a website that runs tests. And the types of tests that I've broken it into is web tests. Most people, most people call them integration tests. I kind of consider them run tests because really... Mostly the difference between unit and this type of testing is that it's running. Um, so <laughs> I built an application, a website. Uh, at this point, it's actually its third generation. And what it does is you store information about what you want to test in Sitecore. And then it shows up here on the forums in the front end. And with that, you can run tests. Nice. Uh, so uh, this is the front end of the design here. I, uh, I designed it myself, took a lot of uh, pride in it. I'm sure there's lots of bugs, but, um, you know, uh, I wanted it to be pal palatable because I felt like no tool is really useful unless people like to use it. Uh, so this here is the front of the web testing page. And let me jump into the back end and just kind of show you how you store content. So here's the content tree and the test star entry there's two main folders. One is the home node, which is the pages for the site. And there's unit web testing, and there's a results list, and an RSS feed for that page. I'll get into that later, though. What's most important, really, is that the, the content, because you're, you have the, it's configurable. Really, you, know, you can tell it what you want it to test. And here, I actually have um, one web test and one unit test that come with the installation. And I also have another one that I'm going to use as a, a demo to show you how uh, to configure your own. 
Uh, but I also have a dictionary, so all, everything on the site is translatable. A uh, test results folder, obviously. Uh, a folder for your site definitions. Here I'm grouping them. Uh, and the environments that you want to be able to test in. So here I have two environments. One is live, one is local. And let's say I wanted to be able to test my own sites. I could go into this uh, internet group that I've already created. I could create one called Mark's House, which would be testing my own website. Now I want to be able to configure, it's basically using this from this list here. And I want to say, I want to have both lo live and local. And what live, that, what live and local are, are prefixes for my domain. So here, live is a prefix with www. Local is a prefix with test. Dot. Test dot is in my host file. It's going to get caught and redirect locally. So now that I've added that, uh, if I jump back into the front end, I hit refresh, you'll see my site pop up. I'm running off the master. I didn't think it would be worth requiring publishing. Uh, so here I'm going to check the two environments that I want to be able to test. I can either check this, which selects all in that group, or I can just check the individual. And then I can say, I have four tests here, basically, that come with this system as a default. An IP test is, is going to match against the IP that it is versus what I've stored. Here I've stored nothing, so both will fail. Uh, if I ping them, it's just going to see if they're both available. Both are. Uh, redirect tests will test to see if the endpoint is a 301 or 302. Otherwise, it will fail. And the sitemap test is going to actually go and hit the sitemap, try to click all the links. If they all return 200, then it passes. If it doesn't, it returns your error. But basically, you have the ability to test a single site or multiple sites on a site core system. And you actually have the ability to test sites that are off the system. So similar to the Federated, Mini Federated Experience Manager, where you're, you're able to work with other systems, you would be able to work with pretty much anything that you can browse to. Uh, so really what I want to get to is, uh, so here my test, one has failed, one has passed. The failure uh, is because my local <coughs> doesn't have a sitemap. Uh, but the live one does. So you, you're also getting good messaging, um, showing the percentage counter to let you know that as the tests are running, where, you're, where you stand, you know, that it is started, that it's a certain way through. Uh, so you have a little bit of user feedback. This testing, you, you have this ability to, to test your sites and, and kind of have a configurable way to, to manage your systems. Right, so... Um, so, so Mark, let me, ask, oh, let me ask you this, Mark. So right now you have two tests, and they're showing up. What happens when you have a long series? Does this page just kind of get all big, long, and scrolly, or do you have that segmented off to kind of group some of those? Can you, what can you do in that space of results? So, well, this, site, this panel here with the sites in it actually is a limited height. It will stretch up to a certain point, and then it will start scrolling. Okay. So that you don't have an infinitely scrolling list. I do actually have a good list at, that I have to manage, so I was uh, conscious of that. Uh, same here with this results list. It's going to have, I don't know, I forget exactly the height, but a little bit below the drop line here, and okay. then it starts scrolling. So the customer experience will really be on this page. There won't be a lot that they'll have to sift through. It'll be all manageable in blocks on the page. Right. Okay. So, and I also did. So, if you shrink it down a bit, it will collapse. Oops. So, this is your responsive experience as well. Yeah. Nice. I mean, there's not very many navigation items, so that's pretty simple. Um, it kind of, I guess, a phone would be much narrower, but it just collapses down. It gives you your results and everything. Uh, very nice. You know, I, I was trying to be you know, aware of just usability. Because mm -hmm. for me, part of this is that information about being able to, so being able to test your system, that's of utmost importance. But two is to be able to have this test system testing itself regularly. Like I, I have here a panel where now I can configure my tests, verify that they're working, or at least, you know, set up how I want them to run. 
and create a script from this. And this script, um, and here it's messaging me that it created it, gives me the path. And if I go to that, you see it's written the script here and it's, it's giving me my sitemap test. And I'm not going to go through this. I think it's actually kind of boring, but <laughs> and you can feed that into what I do is I feed it into my schedule tasks so that my system is being tested uh, in, a, in a series of other tests once a day at least. Okay. And these tests go into uh, the test results page, which I can show you here. So they're listed here, and this is you know, probably not the greatest view of it, but actually the, the better view is this RSS feed. Uh, and it will tell you what's going on. So every morning when I come in, I get my tea, I go to sit down, and I start reading my um, all, the, all the things in my outlook. And I, one of the things is this. Mm -hmm. I can tell, you know, that I'm having problems or I'm not, you know, because maybe somebody just changed some content and something blew up. That's happens. They deleted a tree or God knows what. Uh, so Authors I never do that. I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> All well-mannered, well-behaved. <laughs> Follow it to a T. That's what they do. Um, let's not slam the authors now. But um, never. What With I like them, is, nothing. So this is kind of a running total, not of just the the you got the one day, but this is kind of a running total of everything that's gone on the day before then, or however your the frequency of what you're running. Yes, and it's actually paged too. So the pager will show up here on the right, and you can click through to, to the past days as it goes on. Um, but it, 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 it breaks it down by the, uh, the binary and then by the test, and then how each status was. gives you a little time so you know, you know if it was in the one in the morning or the one in the evening. Uh, it's just kind of a way to kind of put all the things, it was all the pieces that I had put them together. Okay. You know, I was running the tests tracking the tests, feeding it to somewhere where I could like analyze it uh, in a regular fashion, and just make some sense of, of the chaos at times, because really, you know, isn't that really what we're doing here, is just trying to tame the chaos. Uh, that is but, a lot what we do. Yes, it is. So part of this is web testing here, but also part of this system is unit testing. And the unit testing is not Let's say there, there are actually better tools to do unit testing. Um, I think the ones that you would use would be NCrunch, uh, which is in your Visual Studio. I'd love that tool, but I've, I'm new to it. I didn't have that at the time when I built this. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, have time, have problems procuring the software because of, for whatever reason, uh, this is free and you can get this and it runs with the system, even though it's probably not the most efficient way it's a way. Uh, well, and then crunch is really more, you know, I got studio open, I'm about ready to dive in. I like the fact here that you have a feed with this because there's a lot of different things I can do. Right here you're showing it up on the screen, but now I can actually parse apart that feed and do different things, notify different people depending on my tests. Um, God, I can even start using Elma with this thing um, in conjunction to kind of triage a lot of this. Yeah, for me it was just so it was so helpful because I had at the time that I really developed the beginning of this, you know, and, and it's just me. I had to uh, <laughs> my system didn't compile, so a lot of the things that I was doing was changing a lot of the code to get everything to work to at least compile and then, you know, instrument it so it would run properly. But when you're doing that, writing unit tests for me at that time didn't make sense. So, you know, spending a lot of time writing tests for code that you're going to remove, me, I was just like, I need to find a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. And integration testing, or web testing, or whatever you call it, mashed potatoes, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, a, a faster way. You can write one test and you can cover many pages. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I was doing. And it was just about, you know, hitting the sitemap and checking all the pages, making sure I'm not getting a 500. I mean, the, the content might show, not show at all which is the problem, uh, but at least I had solved one problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you, but you can, you can attach like Selenium too. I don't know how familiar you are with that. I've never used it. I've heard about it, but you could grab that. You can grab the page, parse it, uh, and run any kind of verification on that as well. 
So, Mark, how how easy is it to expand the test that you give us and, and sort of create our own custom tests? So, I think the easiest way to explain that would be to show you what the test is, because it's really not much. Um, so, my web tests, web tests. So let me show you, the, this one's fairly complicated. It's the sitemap test for what it does. Uh, and all I'm doing is, th this is using NUnit. It's the same as any old test that has the test declaration. And in here, I'm creating a string format to get the sitemap. Uh, I'm taking, there are, I do have a base web test. And basically, this is passing in a handful of uh, variables that are my HTTP response, um, let me see if I've got my my test contest uh, context test. So the, the test that's going on right now, uh, the method, the environment that I'm in, the site that I'm trying to hit, the response status of the request, and, and these things, all that I can I can use to to build a URL and call a URL. Because really, at the heart of it, all I'm doing is making this web request right here. And then based on what I get it back, I'm either doing an assert fail, or at the end here, you know, it's passing by not hitting an assert of any kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you think of it, really, if you can set up a unit test, and you know how to make a web request, you can really do anything with it. I'm just providing a framework for you to run it in, get results, view it all. But ultimately, you know, if you can get your hands on a sitemap or anything. You can call a web service, get, you know, some other information and use that to build web requests and pass or fail your tests. So, so let's talk about that a little and I'll try not to steer you on too big of a tangent, but um, I will admit being late to the whole TDD party and whatnot. Yes, yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> So, no, I mean, like, uh, it's not like anybody was just like born knowing this stuff. I mean, and even I have been only, you know, I've come around it from like backwards. You know, everybody else does unit testing and then they're starting to do like integration testing. It was right. opposite. Well, and we don't want to get into the debate of, you know, everything being an integration test with Sitecore. We've, we're going to avoid that whole topic. But how do you, looking at a site, how do you determine this is what I want to test? Uh, for me, I mean, at the very minimum, I'm just trying to test whether or not I'm throwing a four or five hundred. Right? That's very valuable information because at least I know that some poor user isn't just getting this thing blowing up in their face. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's helpful. Uh, the other thing too is that it's not just sites I test. I test. I actually have like a handful of IIS redirects. So I'm. That's why I actually have a, an, a redirect test because some of the information I'm storing isn't necessarily even just an actual website you're hitting, it's other things, you know, just to make sure that the that system's working or I have an IP attest to make sure my DNS is working. So there are a bunch of different things. I haven't really gotten into the nitty gritty of testing like a website, like submit a form and make sure that you get this text back or something like that. Mm -hmm. But you could uh, if you needed to. Very, Very cool. good. I noticed that you had an end unit reference. Now, can I use any of my favorite testing scaffolding with this, or does it have to be end unit? Uh, I'm deploying end unit with it. Okay. If you might would you might be able to you would. I mean, it makes end unit calls, so it probably wouldn't work with another one. You'd have to rewrite much of it. Okay. But you know, you could if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm always, I, I, I started out any unit, and I'm always, I'm now kind of this MS test guy, right? So yeah. it's, it's, I, I went the other way. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah, I did, uh, I had the, the test project, but eventually I just could never get a license for it because of the cost, and I was like, and then I can, that's what I actually converted it the second time, and I was like, built, started building any unit, and mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Very good. So... Outside of the HTTP context and the, and the response that we can do with HTTP or, or basically any 
communication channel through this, any web request, really. Um, can it be expanded to go outside of the web request itself? So is there a capability right now to potentially do another communication mechanism, um, maybe perhaps check on some SQL um, connection and response um, without going through web request? Is that is that a feasibility or something planned in the near future? So this, if you, uh, uh, yes, 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 it is. Uh, the reason it is is because this site here, if you're looking at the test star, the test star is running on Sitecore. So when the code runs, you're in a Sitecore context, and you can query the Sitecore database. You can query any database, really, that you have a connection string to. Uh, so you're not limited by, like, and, and when you're running, when I first started learning unit, NUnit, you know, they give you the, the UI, which is running as a desktop app. And maybe you put, you can, I don't know if there's an executable or something you can run from batch or not, but um, as I guess some of the CIs come with it, so they, they, it is kind of transferable, but I feel like this is more transferable in the sense that it goes where a live running website runs. Okay. So, and it can test the sites on the same system that it lives. So others, you could have a multi-site system and you could have this one running and testing all the others, which is what I have. Um, but while it's doing it, you know, it's live active content. So in my case, some of the things that I'm trying to get to testing, uh, and I can show you this actually too here is, uh, nope. My own data importer. If I run and I refresh, now it's, it's showing up here. I'm, I've got my own libraries that I'm trying to test. And if I go to unit tests, you know, I can select them and I run them. But what I want to be able to do is my data imported, you know, I've, I've been asked a few times why I would want to test Sitecore, but I'm not testing Sitecore, I'm testing what I'm trying to do with Sitecore. Because when I run the data importer, it's importing the data and it's, it's uh, what a better, better word than mutating it, but really it's what kind of it's doing. It's, it's changing it on its way through. And I need to be able to test that process and so Sitecore is involved. I mean, I actually looked at um, the fake DB, which is, I don't know if you've seen that too. Fake DB is awesome. I, <laughs> uh, Pavel deserves respect for that. Uh, but basically that's running in a, using an app config to overwrite the connection strings to the database. Not the connection string, the, the data provided to the, to the database. Mm -hmm. So it's cutting it back and feeding it to itself. And you can run serialized data from it. So if you were to serialize a chunk of content, that actually starts to make sense for me. Uh, it starts to conflict because I'm in, I'm running in a web application environment. So the app config isn't quite, it's competing, you know. Mm. Yeah. So I haven't figured all of that out yet. But, but being able to just test it in a Sitecore environment so that I can do some of the more complicated transformations that end up happening as a result of, in my case, a data importer. Uh, you know, it's invaluable because I don't know how I'm going to keep growing and testing these things unless I have that tool. Uh, plus, you know, it's just important to be testing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, can I get? Can I do a tagline? I can be like, "Get tested." Like <laughs> <laughs> that. That's going to get frozen okay. as an image now. You do. Know be that. my. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> But, but for me, it is, it's not like this like religious quest to make sure that like any and all know that like testing is this thing. It's that, you know, I, I struggled with it trying to get to a point where I knew that my system was, you know, at least sufficiently tested that I could trust it. And, and I worked with agencies where I know testing becomes uh, less of a priority. So being able to develop a tool that could be potentially used by people at agencies that are time constrained and need to be able to test multiple things, uh, sometimes in a central place and automate them and see feeds. You know, it's a no-brainer. Um, so that's really kind of what this tool is, too, and the, and the audience that I was really targeting. Cool. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great tool. I mean, I like, first of all, I like the look of, of the dashboard, right, because that's just me. Um, <laughs> this, this is kind of where I, 
my comfort level is, right? The whole... Uh, did you catch the background stranger? Oh, yeah. Yes. I did. And that's, that's <laughs> sweet. It looks that's a so lot like my Mac, because that's how my Mac does it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm right at home with that background. Um, you know, and, and the thing for me, it's it, I have a dashboard where everything's at. You had mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, you had mentioned that end unit. You know, it's kind of this desktop app, and we can do end crunch, and we can get things in the gutter to see what's going on. But um, <clears throat> we really don't have a core dashboard in either of those products, except for I'm green, and I can I can drill down in my hierarchy. Here, I can actually do control, result, you know, and 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 you know, easily color coded just to find out if I'm red or if I'm green or if I'm yellow. Um, and I have a little bit more versatility running it from this context, which I really like. I really like that a lot. And the fact that I could pass this off to a customer, the, the data import example is perfect because how often does data come in badly when the, when the source systems are changed? I mean, mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're talking about um, propagation through like a, a BizTalk or a, an Indeca um, where it's kind of flattening everything out to bring it in, um, you're really relying on what happens in your source system. And, and usually the knock on the door is something like, well, this product doesn't look like this or... You know, this didn't come in correctly. It's got the wrong price, right? Well, now you can start testing those scenarios out to a point and, and at least have that automation every day knowing that you're, you, you have a healthy system. Yeah. And that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know we used to have a use case um, where we would pull in XML from a third party and they would arbitrarily change their XML structure. And then, you know, three <laughs> weeks later, somebody would send me an email saying, this page doesn't work anymore. And I'd be like, well, what happened to it? And here it was the third party source had changed and, you know, rudely didn't notify us of their change. Who? Who? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think he says the name. Who? Did I? I stuck a fork in the electrical <laughs> socket. It just blew up. How was I supposed to know? <laughs> uh, Wait, the word Oracle did not come out of my mouth in that sentence, did it? I think you said Ridley. That's what I thought you said. Oh, uh, it was, I, it I was, no, nah, it was Oracle. Oh, okay. Well, we'll edit all that part of it out. Don't worry about that. That'll never see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> With a big logo, it's like. Yeah, well, I'll, put it, I'll, I'll beep you up because I haven't been able to use the beeper since the first episode. There you go. All right. <laughs> So, Mark, what else, you know, what else does this do from a standpoint? I mean, is it pretty much just the web request, or does it, is it a little bit more versatile, or are there other things to it? I mean, it's really kind of a, it's really a shell. Think of it as more of like a shell. It is just, it's mostly supposed to be a console for you to be able to do both, and, mm -hmm. or, you know, the testing and, and just kind of analyze. Um, and I, I wanted to, because there are other tests that I have for myself and my system, but I didn't think they were, you know, uh, generic enough to be, you know, shared. Because I think that everybody's going to come up with their own needs. So really just being able to plug into it quickly was more of the, you know, I wanted to make an extension, something that you could extend for yourself with a, instead of being all-purpose, you know, tool. Okay. So how do we, um, what is the installation process for TestStar? Is it just a Sitecore package? Yeah, so there's, there's you know, a bit of uh, file system and there's a bit of data. The, the data is the tree and the mm -hmm. templates. Uh, the file system is this layout here and the CSS, JS that comes with it. Uh, the binaries, uh, it actually comes with end unit. It comes with a patch config to define the site in the config, uh, sites mm -hmm. area. Um, so it's... Like I said, it, it's basically installing a, a website. So it should be very something you should be comfortable with anyway, you know, mm -hmm. what, what the limits are of the website. Um, and, and just be able to, you know, plug it in and plug it out if you need to. Because it's not, I'm not trying to, you know, create this thing you have to dig out later. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that you can kind of move around pretty quickly. So, so does it... Um... Does it handle bindings on the installation, or would I have to manually add bindings for the website portion? So it's going to drop in a config file. I can show you that, too. 
So this here, this UI library, uh, if you were to pull the source code, contains everything that gets copied in uh, during a installation. Uh, so it has a binary for itself with some of these uh, extensions. Uh, this, this doesn't copy the packages in, but they are in here in the source as well. And the XML in case you want to customize your own and build a package uh, and catch everything that, that it should get caught. Um, some more classes. You see as S, there are some fonts. You can tell I'm using fonts. Uh, the images for the design. Um, uh, JavaScript file, uh, layouts. This is just a placeholder, so when scripts get generated, that this folder is there. Okay. Uh, the, the web service. So the, the way that it's working, too, is that when I hit, click, or run, it's making a JavaScript uh, Ajax call to this test service that gets installed. And all it's doing is being able to hit itself and then query its tree and say, get me all the sites, you know, get me all the binaries and list them out. And it's using this, you know, Ajax callback to run all the tests, which is how it's giving you kind of like live feedback as the tests finish. Um, so, and then it's just broken down into other constituent parts. Uh, but the, the config here, I'm just patching it after the website. Test start out local is the default uh, host entry. It's giving it the content path and everything else you would expect. It comes with a handful of settings that are basically IDs of elements in the content tree and their template types, just so I can quickly jump in and query the items and, and get the information back. Mm -hmm. But other than that, there's not like, I didn't you know, add anything to the core, or there aren't any you know, elements anywhere hidden that you don't, you know, you don't know about. Uh, it should be pretty straightforward. Very good. How about, um, can you flip back to your, your site core instance real quick? Yeah. So, uh, what versions are we compatible with? Do you know that? It's definitely 6.4 uh, up to, and this is 7.1. I bet you it would work uh, even on 8. I don't think I'm doing anything outside of the realm of Sitecore's API that's very complicated. And I'm also really mostly relying on in units, so mm -hmm. it's there's not a lot. I mean, I haven't tested it in 8 or any of the other versions. I'd imagine it would be fairly well received. Uh, I'll get there eventually, but yeah, I haven't got there yet. And so my next question, and the real reason I asked you to come back here, is I see the... Um, I see the test results uh, node there. Yep. So is that where your results are being saved? Um, oh, excellent. Okay. Yep. So should people pay attention to this and, and purge this regularly after a, a time period? or? I guess my thought was that eventually you'd probably just bucket it. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it myself, but you could and just let it be. Um, you know, stored as it is, just so that it can be, you know, run through a, I think it's probably the content search. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Because otherwise, you don't really want to go digging in there. I mean, it's not compelling content. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I could see doing a history search on a particular issue or, you know, one of those yeah. issues that's not consistent, but it pops every so often. So yeah. I can definitely see the search utilization for that. Yeah, that, creating a bug would probably make more sense in the long term. Yeah, agreed. There is actually one thing I probably should show you too. So I opened up uh, another tab here just to give you a live example of what it is I do with this. So I don't know if you've seen this. This is the caching manager. And this is running on my live site. Here, if I get a summary of my cache entries, uh, and I show you what the, you know, what my cache is, it's full right now. Mm -hmm. I were to clear this and get a summary here. Now you're going to see that it's at zero, right? So let me just keep refreshing so that you see the, uh, they kind of go to nothing. So really, 
Display isn't much happening, but if I go to my test page, and this is another thing I like to do every time I clear my uh, recycle my app pool or clear my cache, I do a sitemap test. This is going to go in, it's just going to hit all my pages and fill up my cache and make my site nice and responsive. Uh, and for me, it's, it's actually really helpful because when I clear my recycle my app pool, there's about at this point, it's uh, 60 or 70 sites, and that would take a long time to do by hand. So yeah. mm -hmm. being able to just, you know, reset my system and get it all, you know, snappy again is, is really a big thing. Because it's not just testing either, and I, I am testing it, but I'm getting other features out of it like this. Hmm. So I could probably switch back. It's probably filling up somewhat. Yeah, you can see it now. It's starting to build up. Yep. Mm-hmm. So you can tell it's doing its job, and that for me is is a lot. Uh, there you go, and it's done. Cool. That's really cool. So what's next for Test Star? Do you have a, a roadmap? I guess I was really hoping to get some user feedback, but there are a couple of little things that I wanted to do. One was to be able to have a setting, some kind of settings on this results so that you could see all messages, only errors, errors and exceptions, or something like that. Because right now I'm getting, you know, results even if everything went okay. So mm -hmm. I'm probably going to want to try to filter out the noise so that as I see my RSS feed fill up, I know it's only because there's problems. Yep. Another thing that I wanted to do was on each individual site, actually add a, a field for port because I want to have um, in my local host, I, sometimes I run PHP sites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry for all that. It does happen. It does happen. <laughs> well, other people won't admit it, but I do the same thing. So yeah. You're, not, you're they, not the only one. <laughs> and they run on other ports. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to just have it uh, pipe the ports into the uh, URL building and, and have it be able to redirect in my local host. So that's one of their feature. Um, I do have other properties here that might end up becoming uh, more standard. I don't know. This might grow or depending on what, how people like this or use it. Uh, but there are two other things here. So if, uh, I know I probably ran through it quicker than I should have. But if, for example, you are building these two live environments, right, for multiple sites. And some of your, most of your sites, for me, I have an integration and a stage. And on my integration, um, not all the prefixes are integration dot domain dot whatever. Some of them are a completely different, you know, domain for some reason or another. If it's a tra training site or who knows, maybe it never will be on staging or production. Uh, so in that event, I need to have I still want it to be running during the local or integration environment when it gets run, but I want it to have a different prefix. So what I have here is a local prefix. So if I were to insert a uh, test environment override, and I would just call it environment, and in here I would create you know, a live, and I changed selected live, and I was like, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And now it's going to, when I run this test on the live environment against this site, it's going to change my prefix instead of from dub, 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 it's going to use integration now. And that just allows me a little bit of flexibility to try to, I did, this actually came out of a need that I had personally, so it does happen. Uh, and these properties here, properties are basically key values. Sometimes if you're building your own web tests, you want to be able to have other information uh, for me, I needed language codes, but you could have pretty much anything you needed and just create a key value and in the test itself. Those properties that come with the base web test, it's, it's in there, and you can access them through that. Uh, so they're really kind of nice to have as just additional information sometimes you need to store. And that's really why this whole Sitecore bit uh, is part of it, because... Uh, originally, I was storing this all in XML files. Then I moved to J JSON files. 
and it, then finally it just made sense to put it in a cycle tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it just gives you that flexibility to store additional additional information. Mm -hmm. Very cool. <clears throat> so if I want to contribute, well, first if I want to use it and I want to contribute, uh, where can I go to do that? So GitHub is the place to be. So github.com slash markstyles under uh, the test, site core test style. This here, uh, I don't know any good way to explain GitHub, but if you know it, you probably already know how to get it. <laughs> if not over here in the bottom right, you can download zip and download it into your system. Yep, perfect. Uh, so there's that. Then, of course, you can hit me on Twitter and complain to me how broken it is if you want. That was, uh, <laughs> that was going to be my next question. If people have questions, how do you want them to contact you? Twitter, Twitter exclusively? Uh, no, you can always, uh, there are, if you really have a, a problem with the code or, or something, you probably want to actually set me uh, an issue report here on GitHub. That would probably be the best way for me to track it. Um, I know I probably don't get to it immediately, but I will get to it eventually. Uh, there are a couple other projects I do try to keep up with, so mm -hmm. I, I do a uh, round robin style. You mean you got other stuff to do besides test star? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not, never. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting around all day, <laughs> making Star Wars jokes, that's me. Uh, but me here, Mark Styles, M-A-A-A-K. Uh, hit me up, complain, kick my teeth in if you want. <laughs> I'm a big boy, I can take it. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Cool. So GitHub, Twitter, and then um, use this thing, you know, and, and give Mark some feedback. It, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to grabbing it. I really want to integrate it with Elma for some reason. I don't know why. I just have the niche, right? You know, it's just like I feel the need to just integrate this with Elma so I can get a tweet of all my errors. That would be perfect. <laughs> right? It's like midnight waking you up. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever my little cell phone ring of the day is. Oh, my wife will love that. So, I think you would have, like, a song for sure. Some kind of, like, punk song or something. No, I could do that. I could definitely do that. But, yeah. I, the fact is, using this, I potentially wouldn't have that problem in the middle of the night. You know what I mean? Because everything would be perfect. Because you would have spent all day fixing it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. There you go. <laughs> At least you knew what, what was wrong, right? Exactly. I knew what was wrong, and I already fixed it, so therefore I never get woken up again. That should, be, that should be a branding tagline. <laughs> Don't get woken up again. <laughs> get tested. Don't get tested. <laughs> Mark, thank you very much for showing us this. Um, Absolutely. So yep. use this. Give some feedback. Um, you know, share what you think. Awesome. Absolutely. I, I'm excited to use it. It looks like a... Uh, Low barrier entry for me to get into the whole TDD thing. Well, You're really, and that is the intended audience right there, is to try to make sure that the people who are still kind of like, what am I trying to do? It's like, this is what you're trying to do. Here yep. it is. You know? and, and as you get more sophisticated, you'll pick up other sophisticated tools, and, uh, but at least you have a, a stepping stone, right? Yep. Absolutely. Thanks again, Mark. Oh, you're yes, thank, thank you. For, and, thank you for the, the chance here. Oh, absolutely. Anytime, man. Anytime you absolutely. want to come back around, let us know. Tell all yeah. your friends about us. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them that there's a podcast. No, really, there is. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, anytime, anytime well, you want to. Well, plug you yeah, anytime I can. Yeah, we'll plug it. us anytime. You can come back on anytime. And we'll do a. We'll do multiple plugs. Absolutely. Perfect. <laughs> If the moose says you're closed, I say you're open. That was a great presentation by Mr. Styles. We thank you again very, yes, very thank much. Thank you very much, Mark. And, you know, one of the things that, that this is from last month, and, and we've kind of fell back a little bit on that whole April release thing. Um, we got a little busy for numerous different reasons. Many things happened between Jamie and I and our personal lives and professional lives, um, which kind of kind of drag things out a little bit. So, 
this essentially is a makeup of the April uh, podcast. Uh, one of the things that did happen in April, as you can see by the date on this, the Xamarin Partnership. Um, you guys, I'll put the, the URL, as you'll see it below right now, to take a look at this article if you have not seen it already. This is... I think a big deal, Jamie. I think this is going to be, you know, right now you have a, a couple of options for mobile mobile presentation, right? We have we have the device um, ability within Sitecore. We have responsive in the HTML stack. The, essentially the HTML, CSS, and, and, and uh, JavaScript library. Yep. And Xamarin kind of, as I understand it, now I haven't played with Xamarin myself. I know there's a lot of people in the community that are jazzed about Xamarin. Um, you know, but this is allowing us basically to use C Sharp to kind of do iOS, Android, Mac, and pure Windows kind of rendering. In native apps, essentially. Mm -hmm. This kind of opens up things a little bit, in my mind, from a Sitecore perspective of presentation and, I guess, that experience. I'm going to use the word because, you know, it needs to be used. Um, yeah, I think the customer is now going to have different channels. Not that they really didn't have it before, but I think now it's going to be a little bit more fitting, if you will. Yeah, I can buy that. Um, coincidentally, about two days after this release came out, um, I overheard a conversation between developers who have nothing to do with Sitecore, but do, 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 do. They do, do. They do, do. They, who doesn't, right? <laughs> I tell my son all the time, everybody poops. <laughs> they do work on mobile apps and they were randomly talking about xamarin and i was i was rather happy to be able to chime in and say "Ooh, sitecore just announced an sdk for that um so that was really cool and i and they were kind of excited to hear it um now they may have been excited sarcastically but we'll give them the benefit of the doubt <laughs> So I'm looking forward to working with this. I'm not a big front end guy personally. Um, I can make things blink, you know. No, I'm kidding. I don't do that. Um, but this is something that definitely I'm I'm looking forward to kind of rolling up my sleeves and kind of digging into a little bit and see what this is all about. Very cool. What do you got, Jamie? So one thing I wanted to quick mention, keep everyone updated on. Um, in episode one, we had talked about the uh, marketplace module that you and I worked on, Mark, the dynamic placeholders. Yeah. Integrated dynamic placeholders, I believe, is the official name. Um, that has recently been updated. So a few people from the community mentioned to us they were having some trouble getting nested dynamic placeholders to work. We finally got a chance to take a look at that found the issue, fixed it, got an update up there. So um, if you've already downloaded one version 1.0, know that there is a version 1.1 with a, a quick fix for you. If you haven't, check it out. It will now support nested dynamic placeholders for you. With that, if there's anybody who wants to share anything, please reach out to us. The email's below. Um, we are coming to the point where we're going to start rattling some more cages for members of the community, but I know there's a lot of people that want to share things, and this is the, yep. why we set up this forum. Yep. So uh, feel free to reach out, and we can get you guys what you need, and you're able to share your information with the Sitecore community. Um, all five of them right now. No, it's actually more than five. I only kid around about five. Well, and if, if you don't do that, if you don't come to us and share, that means we are forced to do the main topics ourselves. Oh. And that means you have to listen and look at us more. And you do not want this guy. This is good right now because I have the sunglasses on. So the creepy eyes stay behind the sunglasses. 
you don't want me. And I'll do it. You know what? I'm going to say it right here. If somebody doesn't start stepping up to be on the show, I'm going to do the next presentation after the next one with no shirt. I, I so thought you were going to say no pants. Well, that's I was right. waiting I'm, for no pants. As you can tell right now by where the line is drawn, you really don't know, do you? I may <laughs> or may not have pants on right now. That is the beauty of this podcast. You just don't know, kids. <laughs> I'm not sure that is the beauty of anything. <laughs> Should I stand? No, 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 no. We don't want to give the surprise Cut. away. Cut. Yeah. Cut. Exactly. No, no. <laughs> Nobody. That's probably worse than my face. All right. Well, uh, you have the email below as we've talked about my underwear now for a little bit long enough. And uh, <laughs> we will see you in episode four. Until next time, don't forget to publish.